Hello, and welcome to Introducing Me. I'm your host, Sarah. I started this podcast to get to know other people and lifestyles while discovering more about myself. Each episode, I will give a new guest a chance to discuss their background, culture, interests, or whatever they want to talk about to help increase all of our own worldviews. Today, I would like to introduce you to Sumi Mukherjee. He is a speaker and author of nonfiction books with topics surrounding racial equity, preventing bullying and child sexual abuse, as well as mental health awareness and education. So I'm excited to hear from Sumi today to learn more about why he's written these books, why the books are so important, and more about him in general. So thank you so much, Sumi, for being here. Why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit more about yourself? Well, uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, very nice to be here, yes. Um, well, I'm Sumi. I am, uh, I'm 46. I live in Plymouth, Minnesota. Uh, I am uh, single at the time, but uh, a huge into dogs and family and friends. And kind of got a late start in my life because of some struggles I went through, which is kind of uh, what my, my first of four books that I've written and published uh, is about my, uh, my own struggle, my own autobiography, essentially, my struggle with bullying, um, bias-based bullying, uh, based on race, ethnicity primarily, um, and the fact that that led to a severe anxiety disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, what it took uh, to overcome the uh, OCD, because it can be overcome, and uh, it took uh, many, many years out of my life to figure that out, and I'm hoping uh, that that first book is able to, you know, give some insight to other people that have to go down this road because it's a pretty common road is what I've learned uh, since realizing and understanding what OCD is. So um, yeah, I think that's kind of about me. I, I live in Plymouth, Minnesota. I've been in Minnesota since I was three. I've been in Plymouth since I was five. So looks like I'm here to stay for a little while. Sounds like it. Would you be willing to take us a little bit through, you know, your childhood and the bullying that you faced and what it was like growing up in Plymouth and kind of, you know, you mentioned why you were bullied based on race and ethnicity. So kind of what that environment was like for you. Sure. Yeah. I have, uh, I have an interesting backstory. Um, my, my mom and dad were both born and raised in India, uh, in a third world country. Uh, they met in Canada and I was actually born in Canada in Calgary in, uh, May of 76, 1976. A little while ago now, we're not going to talk about how long ago, but a little while ago. <laughs> and um, uh, they became U.S. citizens when I was just nine months of age. They decided, um, they debated whether or not to go back to uh, home, which was, you know, what they considered their home their whole lives, which was India, the country of India. Um, and uh, But ultimately, they decided they felt they had the education and the, uh, you know, the uh, the financial uh, comfort and privilege uh, to some degree to be able to perhaps give their future, their child and their future children maybe something of a better life than, than a lot of the struggles and things they went through growing up in India, a third world country, which is very, very poor. And uh, they just felt they could give us a better shot at everything, you know, that mattered and was important by bringing us to a, a land of opportunity, the United States of America, you know, so uh, I became a U.S. citizen at uh, nine months of age. We lived in Florida during my toddler years. Uh, we came to Minnesota when I was three years old. Um, I grew up in uh, and went did all my schooling in the town of Plymouth since I was five. Um, Minnesota is in the Midwest of the United States. Um, it's very predominantly Caucasian, white population, even still today. And growing up in the early 1980s uh, and then through the 80s and the 1990s, um, I really stood out. I really stood out in a way that became uh, was a very negative thing, and it was something that my parents did not anticipate um, I would have to go through, or that my younger brother, who came four years after me, would have to go through uh, when they made the decision to, you know, not bring us back to their native land of India, but to raise us in this new country, the United States, and that uh, that had a really big impact on my life. And I understand today that. You know, I've given talks about bullying and mental health all over the country, even in Canada. And it's not just, you know, being a minority, a person of color. It can be anything. You know, kids are, you know, singled out and bullied because they are somehow perceived as being 
different in some way. It can be their height, their weight, uh, their skin is too light. I mean, I've, I, they have glasses. They don't have glasses, you know, tall, short. I mean, I, I've heard every possible reason that kids have told me they've been bullied or singled out. Uh, so it's certainly not just a person's race or ethnicity that can cause that. But in my case, that was primarily what it was. Um, I had a very unusual first, middle, and last name as well. Those were also factors. And I think somehow we're just missing the point as a society of teaching our children collectively that differences are not bad. You know, um, perceived differences particularly, any difference, but perceived differences are, are not bad. Actual differences are not bad either. You know, people are different. We're not all cut from the same cloth and it's very sad that, you know, that that's the, I think the core reason around bullying is that someone is perceived as being different from the majority. And, uh, and it happens to a lot of kids, uh, too many kids. And I was lucky, I think, that in spite of how generally miserable my life was at school, uh, my life at home was the polar opposite of school. Um, uh, I had two parents that still... Uh, very, very much support me to this day. I mean, that was my dad helping me get the computers set up and everything just now to do this podcast. I'm 46 years old. Um, I injured my shoulder. I had shoulder surgery, and I'm, my parents have been helping me, uh, let, letting me crash at their home a few times a week, helping me with my arm, which is typically in a sling. I have it off right now. But uh, so that's the kind of support I still have in my life at 46 years old. And a lot of young people, maybe even the majority of young people, don't have that support at home. And I had that at home. So that kind of, I think, allowed me to, gave me the capability to survive everything I went through at school. And then the bullying, the severe years of severe bullying, um, the related uh, severe anxiety disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder that I believe was a uh, sort of repercussion of being bullied uh, kind of was a consequence of that, sort of came because of that. And um, it, it's been a horrible ordeal, uh, but I survived it. And I think in, in big part because I had the kind of support I had at home and still do. And it's a response. I see it as a responsibility. It was a responsibility to write that first book and be able to share my story that I made it so that other people that are in school and in that situation can see that, you know what? As horrible as this is, it's worth getting to a better place, and that better place is so worth it, and giving up is just not an option. And these kind of things, you know, mental illnesses, they, they're terrible, they stink, but they can be overcome, and and there's hope, and they can be defeated and overcome, and that's the important thing. So that's, that's kind of what got me into the whole uh, environment of writing, was wanting to just tell my story first to help people, and then realizing that... Oh, this is something I enjoy. Maybe I can uh, uh, make a career out of this if I'm able to. So, Yes, and it's so good to hear that you had that great support. You had that escape from, you know, schooling not being great, but when you would go home, it was polar opposite. It was what you needed to get to where you are today. So yes. can you share a little bit? you know, what that was like with the OCD and coming out on the other side of bullying to the place where you are now? Yeah, it was, uh, bullying was a hard thing to go through um, at the time because back in my time in the 1980s and 90s, there was really no vast awareness about the fact that bullying is a problem and it needs to be stopped. Uh, I think that awareness is there today um, on social media and and so on and so forth. Um, of course, the flip side of that is that there is also a lot more bullying on social media. And that was a problem my generation didn't have to deal with. Um, so that's the other side of it. But at least today, there is, you know, you walk into schools and there's like signs up that say no bully zone, you've entered a bully free zone or a bully free school. And then that's nice to see that stuff because that stuff wasn't around when we were kids. We weren't supposed to talk about it. It was kind of just seen as, well, that happens to the unlucky kids that it happens to. And, you know, you just kind of teachers didn't see it as their job. Principals didn't see it as their job to intervene. Their job was strictly to teach academics. And I think now I'm hoping that's different and that's changed. So at the time, it was hard because there was really, what do you do? You know, a lot of times you're being bullied. You know, people tell you, especially other males, if you're a male, other males tell you, retaliate, fight back, you know? 
And so I tried that, and some of the time that worked, some of the time that made it worse, uh, some of the time that uh, reduced whatever incentive teachers may have had to help you a little bit. If they saw you retaliating, they kind of were like, hey, you're doing it too, you know, in their in their perception, they they saw you as someone that was doing it too. So it was really a no-win situation. It was really bad. Um, uh, and then eventually I, I did develop OCD. It's called obsessive compulsive disorder. It's, it's known as the doubting disease. Um, it can present itself in many different forms. There's many different forms of OCD. Um, uh, some of it is, you know, germs and cleanliness or keeping things very straight or a certain way, doing things a certain way. Uh, for me, it was more horrendous thoughts. Uh, ir- it's, it's usually always irrational concerns and thoughts and then the feeling that you have to do some kind of compulsive behavior or some ritual physically or even mentally to try to make those negative thoughts go away. And there's a part of you that knows that none of this is rational. This doesn't make sense even to me. But I feel compelled that I have to do these ritualistic things. And for me, I would, I could be doing something mundane, like taking a sip of water, and then I would have the mental image in my mind of someone who had bullied me, and I would kind of feel like that image had some magical power over me because I had felt intimidated by that person whose image I was thinking of. And then I felt like, well, I have to retake my sip of water or else something bad's going to happen. It's going to be my fault. And that's kind of how the disease works. It's It's caused... Also caused by a chemical imbalance in the brain, but I think uh, traumatic experiences in life can bring that out a little more, and I think that's what happened in my case. Um, It took, as I explained in my first book, A Life Interrupted, the story of my battle with bullying and obsessive compulsive disorder. I explain uh, how I confronted my worst childhood bully as an adult, Uh, the conversation we had where he opened up about why he was a bully, what he was going through in his personal life. And the fact that later on he ended up with a whole nother mental illness of his own in his adult years uh, that ultimately, very tragically, took his life. And uh, it was it was an opportunity to see, you know, what I got out of confronting this person and, and what I learned about why bullies do what they do, how they can be helped, that sort of thing. And then my everything I learned for over so many years time as to how to defeat OCD, how to face your fears uh, how being on the proper medication, if you if you have a severe case like I had, uh, being on the proper medication is extremely essential and really helps you. And I was fortunately able to do that. And I explained that um, in A Life Interrupted, how I reprogrammed my thinking uh, to overcome these rituals and these compulsive behaviors and these fearsome thoughts. And um, And that's what I teach other people how to do. Great. Well, it's good to hear how all of that has transpired and, you know, wanting to share your own story is so important so that other people can hear. So why have yeah. you chosen to stay in Minnesota? Um, it, uh, it's the people, uh, the people that are important to me, my loved ones, my friends, friends, meaning, you know, same thing as loved ones, you know, people that I care about, um, are all here. And there's, there's times where I, uh, you know, I guess when I was younger, I didn't really have the opportunity to leave. Um, I was struggling so hard with my OCD, my mental health issues. I kind of wasn't really on the table till I got into, till I got better, which was my late twenties, early thirties. And, uh, I just ended up staying and now, uh, I, I vacation to nice places whenever I, whenever I have a little bit of fair change and I can afford to, but, uh, this is home because of everybody I care about here. So. I've ended up staying and trying to make a life for myself here. But I, I do wonder sometimes how my life would have been different if my parents had gone back to India. And uh, certainly I think some things would have been easier. Some things would have been harder. Um, and, but it's just it's mind boggling to think because I, I would have I would have spoken a different language. I may not have, even, you know, learned much English if I grew up there. I might have been an entirely different person, may have had an entirely different set of struggles. I wouldn't have met any of the important people in my life that I met living here. So it's it's a strange thing to think about. But I'm trying to make the best of uh, the life I have here and uh, my parents' choice to uh, raise us in this country and in Minnesota. Definitely. I asked because, you know, you, you shared about how Minnesota is very Caucasian and, you know, you experienced all this bullying based on race and ethnicity. So I wasn't sure if, like, 
wanting to get out of Minnesota was ever really a thought. It, it's been a thought. Yeah, it's been a thought, but it's kind of uh, never happened. Uh, life, is, life has gotten busy. Um, but primarily right now, um, everybody I care about is here and I'm, I'm used to, I'm used to here, you know, I mean, this is, it's got its issues, but it's, it's home now. It's been home for 41 years, you know, 43 years since I was three, uh, Plymouth since I was five. So, um, it's, it gets harder to leave when you've, when you've been in a place that long. So. Yes. And have you had the chance to visit India? I did, yes. Uh, many, many uh, decades ago when I was five and then I was nine. Um, I've never been back since because those trips were really difficult trips to make uh, all the way there and back. Um, a tremendous amount of time in an airplane. Uh, we couldn't eat the food correctly. Um, we got sick, uh, a lot of diseases to worry about, could only go at a certain time of year. So there was, there was a lot of things. And but most notably, I think the, the flight time was uh, extremely, extremely hard. It's almost a uh, total of 24 hours in a plane to go there and then the same 24 ultimately to come back. And, uh, and that's, that's too long for me. I, I went to Hawaii this summer. That was eight hours each way. That was about my limit. So. Yes, even eight hours is a lot in a plane. I think so. I agree with you. I think it's a lot. Yes, it is a lot. So it's been hard. I, I mean, if it was closer, I would really be motivated to go back. But there was just a lot of a uh, lot of difficulty, a lot of hardship in going there, coming back. And I have those memories of having the hardship when I was very little, very young. And so it kind of stands out as something I haven't been eager to go back. And also, I've been fortunate to some degree that a lot of relatives and stuff have come to the United States. So that's kind of been a, been a good thing, too. Right. Definitely convenient in terms of travel. Yeah, for me, yes. <laughs> so you mentioned earlier when talking about the fact that since you didn't grow up in India, you know, you would have been speaking a different language. Were your parents like when you were being raised, were they speaking more than one language or were they primarily English? Well, that's interesting. Uh, they both came from different parts of India. And um, unlike most people in their time and place, they did not have an arranged marriage. They actually met each other sort of on their own, the American way. They met each other in Canada and uh, fully chose one another um, as partners um, without parental uh, involvement at all. And um, they they came from different parts of India that spoke different languages. So they each spoke a different language from each other. And when they made the choice to raise us in United States and Minnesota, they just figured, well, you know, let's just, let's not bombard them with languages. Let's just, you know, let them speak English because <laughs> that's really what they need to speak to get through their life and school and everything. And um, so that was the choice they made there. Um, uh, and it, it's also interesting that I'm, you know, I've, I didn't start dating till my late 20s due to my mental illness. Uh, I had to overcome that first before I was really able to function in that way. Um, I've had a lot of relationships that didn't work out. Um, so I'm still single at 46, but it's odd to think if I had grown up in India, I might have had an arranged marriage at 18. I could be a grandpa by now if I had grown up there. So I think a lot of things would have been radically different um, in my life. But uh, And so there's... We'll never know which which would have been the more optimal, you know, place for us to grow up. But you kind of make do with what you got. And I think there are a lot of advantages to growing up in the United States. I, I don't think I would have had the same kind of uh, help and treatment for my OCD in India as I was able to find in the United States. In between Minnesota and and the, and the uh, Rogers Memorial Hospital in Oconomowoc, Wisconsin, where I spent uh, about 16 days there. Uh, they were able to change my medication to something I'm still on today that's made a huge difference. So being in the United States helped in that sense. Sounds like it. Now you've written more books since that first book about bullying and the OCD. So can you share, take us through the journey, I guess, of those different books and what they mean? Yeah. Um, after that, I, I had a, you know, it's interesting that I, I think I've met a lot of so many different people now in my life. And, uh, 
whenever I tell people I'm an author, they tell me things about their life. And I'm like, wow, you know, you could write a book about that. You could write a book about that. You know, I think crazy, seemingly crazy, wild, interesting things happen to all of us. But uh, in my life, I've been able to chronicle them into stories, into books about these these real life experiences I've had that are uh, strange. And I think uh, more common than we think, but I think in many cases, people don't get involved further. So it doesn't become a big thing, but I, I chose to get involved further. And that's kind of what leads me to what my second book was about. Um, I was friends with a uh, lady, a single mother. Uh, we had dated briefly, but then we had decided we would just be friends. Uh, she had two little girls, two young daughters, and eventually she began dating somebody that ended up being a convicted child sex offender, a convicted child molester, um, out on parole from prison uh, for sexually molesting the daughter, the young daughter of the last woman he was with, you know, and now he's dating my friend and she's got two daughters the same exact age as the girl he was convicted of molesting and did prison time for molesting. And he's registered on Minnesota sex offender registry. And um, that was an interesting story. Uh, I, I tried to warn my friend as would be the first natural thing for anybody to do. Um, unfortunately, she, uh, in spite of knowing everything about this individual's history, she uh, chose to, Unfortunately, so it chose to put her needs first and to continue to uh, be romantically involved with this individual. And, and furthermore, than just continuing to be romantically involved, she continued to directly involve her children with him. And there was even, to my understanding, court orders in place, uh, restrictions in place where he was not permitted to have that kind of contact with females under the age of 18 who were not his own biological daughter. Um, so I basically, uh, going against the wishes of the children's own mother, I saw a significant high likelihood for a threat towards those kids. Um, uh, I'd become like an uncle, father, dad figure to these, these two young girls. And, uh, I felt, felt a real sense of responsibility towards them. Um, I'd always been interested in crime and, uh, you know, pathology of criminals and, you know, particularly, you know, murderers and rapists and sex offenders and stuff like that. So I'd watched a lot of TV shows about them, like America's Most Wanted, studied a lot of real true crime kind of broadcast shows about them, documentaries and such. And I, I had a very bad feeling. Uh, I knew everything, all the details about this particular individual who in the book I call him Charlie, about the, the convicted predator, uh, about Charlie's past what his crime involved, what all he even admitted to doing to this little girl, and uh, what he admitted to fantasizing about with regards to very, very young underage girls. And I had real concerns about him being allowed by the mom to be around her daughters. And it was, it's really a story of what I had to go through as a non-blood-related, non-family member, but a family friend only, what I had to go through with the police child protection, um, the probation system, the Department of Corrections, uh, the uh, um, family law attorneys, uh, the judge from the, this defendant's prior case, uh, and, and what it all took and, and how I, was, I met challenges every step of the way, going to the police, going to child protection, the places that you think would be there to help a child in need. And I was, I learned a lot. I learned a lot that uh, things don't work the way we think they're going to work, you know, and uh, you think the police are there to help you and God willing, they usually are, but there's situations where maybe they're not. And maybe child protection is, you know, not as interested. And, and they, uh, they would call such a case a low priority. And I couldn't understand how it was a low priority. Um, and so those are kind of the things that I had to deal with. And eventually I was able to help those kids, but you wouldn't believe what it took. It took jumping through so many hoops. And I, I share that story because, you know, I wish I had had a manual of how to do that when I was going through it for the three to four months I was dealing with this issue before I was able to bring about a change directly, indirectly that protected these two children from this person in the long run. Uh, so it's a very interesting story of, uh, preventing sexual abuse of children and 
uh, understanding how abuse works, uh, how kids react to it, um, what caregivers of children can do to prevent it, um, and how to understand what these the predators are thinking and how to uh, how to be one step ahead of them and the importance of doing. Uh, for example, one example, there's many examples, but one example I can think of is single parents, single mothers, especially dating somebody, the great importance of doing a background check on that person, a criminal background check before allowing them around your kids. Um, in my, in this story, I did the background check when I had suspicions about this individual and to my shock, I was right. Um, so that taught me something. The, the importance of a criminal background check. Uh, and so it really highlights what what all, it shouldn't have been anywhere as difficult as it was to try to intervene with success. And it was really difficult, extremely difficult. And that's where we need to change because the systems in place, had they performed the way they, ideally they should have, this would have been nipped in the bud, but it wasn't nipped in the bud and it wouldn't have been. Uh, without constant, obsessive, stubborn involvement uh, by myself and others that I got to help me with that. But so th that's the story of really how I was able to, you know, help these, save these two kids and how others can do the same thing and how care, what caregivers of children can learn and what children themselves can learn uh, if they're being violated. For example, so many kids aren't comfortable talking to their parents. Maybe their parent is the person doing it. Maybe their parent is dating the person doing it, like was in this case with these girls and their mom. And uh, the example that is a good example from this story is uh, Charlie's first victim, uh, his, his wife's daughter, so his stepdaughter, uh, the one he was prosecuted for abusing. She did not tell her mom, but the very next day she told the school. She told school officials, and they got child services involved and the police involved. So that highlights the importance that you know officials at school have in helping in these situations, and that kids may not feel comfortable going to their parents. So I think there's a lot to learn from that story. There, also, yeah, there is, and I think you know, those girls and other people in similar situations are probably very grateful that you didn't give up because if it is such a difficult process to go through, you know, you could say, not my kids, not my problem, but that's not helping the greater good. It's not helping those It would kids. have been the easiest thing to do. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, and, and to, to write it all out and kind of get it out there to show, Hey, like, this is what you can do. This is, you know, these stories are out there and exist. And, you know, as you said, a lot of kids won't tell their parents these things and, you know, they, they need other support outside of them. They do, because I think often it's a myth that, um, you know, sexual predator is, is some creepy looking person that jumps out of the bushes somewhere that you don't even know, a complete stranger. In reality, most sexual uh, predators are very well known to the child, to the family. Sometimes they are family. and. Uh, Uncles, parents, step parents, teachers, coaches, priests, it could be anybody, anybody that's close to the family, anyone that's close to the kid. And that's where um, kids need to know that they need to tell someone they can trust. Yes. And that they need to talk about it, even if there's threats by the person, even if there's guilt trips by the person that, you know, you're going to hurt your mom if you tell her, you know, or that I'm going to, you know, perpetrators often say, I had a friend just tell me that a babysitter. Uh, abused her when she was really little and said, I'm going to kill your parents if you tell. And she didn't go to the police. She was eight. She didn't go to the police till she was 21. And, you know, finally she found the courage and the police told her, hey, statute of limitations is passed. There's nothing we can do now. Uh, so kids need to know that, you know, offenders make those threats, but you have to ignore it. They're, they're just saying that to be intimidating. You still need to tell somebody. And uh, ER, one person even told me, you know, my mom had been through so many breakups I didn't want her to lose another boyfriend. So I didn't tell her what my stepdad was doing to me in the shower. And I, I thought, wow, you know, it's like that was her heart was in the right place. But kids need to understand there's some situations where you need to be a little selfish and it's not selfish. You need to protect yourself and your mom has to lose another boyfriend. So be it. That's a person that could be a danger to the next child, not just you also. 
So it's a lot to learn, I think, for kids, for everybody. Yes. I learned a lot. I learned a lot. I learned so much I didn't know about how our system of justice works in reality. Yes. And it's it's so hard to, you know, kind of put yourself first. We We see a lot of putting other people's feelings and their situations before their own, but might not think in that long term, like, well, what about other people who may come next? So that was book two. You've got like... That was book two. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So can you share about book three? Because all of your books are so different. <laughs> yeah, they are. They're, they really encompass a, a wide variety of topics. Um, my third one was uh, also about... Uh, was about basically the theme uh, ultimately became sort of a manual on how to stand up for your rights at work against an unjust employer. Um, an employer that's being unfair towards you. And it's it's a tricky area because obviously not everything unfair you can do something about, you know. Um, in, in this in particular, you know, story, the, the things you can do something about is if you're being treated differently because of a protected class status, because of your race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, um, I think age also. There, there's a bunch of categories where if you can show that's why you're being treated badly at work, if you have evidence or proof, um, uh, then you can take action against your employer. But not everything that's unfair falls into those categories. Um, uh, and so I, I had a situation that involved me. I was working at a childcare facility. Um, there was a uh, supervisor. That, there were two issues kind of that I was dealing with in this situation. One was um, I was one of the few males working there, so I, I certainly experienced uh gender discrimination for being working with kids as a male um and uh we were the men were the minority at this place of work there was a few other men too but we were definitely the minority at this which as a man you don't think about usually that you're going to be a minority working at a certain environment as a male but that's what ended up happening and also more more so the fact in this case there was a there was a supervisor mistreating the children repeatedly and uh it's an interesting, interesting character she was. She was uh, uh, very, uh, very imposing in size, and she was uh, very, had a very scary persona, um, very loud, uh, intimidating individual, and uh, everybody was afraid of her. I mean, everybody, nobody, you know, she would, she would do things that were completely against the guidelines of the, the child care center that I worked at, that she would, you know, treat the kids verbally, physically in ways that were completely against the guidelines, uh, bordering on possible child abuse. And there would be volunteers coming in and other workers, coworkers, supervisors, bosses. Nobody did anything. Um, and I, I, I was diligent about trying to report these things. And eventually they, they fired me for reporting it. Um, nobody was doing anything, so I went above and beyond, uh, kind of outside of the chain of command. I went to the board of directors because this involved children, little children, uh, being mistreated, ages zero to six, being mistreated. And uh, eventually they fired me for that, and uh, without any cause, because fortunately, this particular employment, uh, we, were, we, we had a union. There was an employee union, and uh, the HR director that was sort of uh, allowing this rogue supervisor to mistreat these kids and kind of get away with everything she'd been doing. This, uh, this HR person um, who herself had a shady, shady background, uh, she was sort of the one that, was, that fired me without any just cause. So eventually I appealed it through my union. Uh, it was a whole long process, but I prevailed. I prevailed in that situation. I got justice for myself. Um, that HR director was... Uh, Resigned very quickly uh, after I began fighting back. She she was an extremely intimidating, uh, vindictive uh, person herself. But once I started fighting back through the system, after being wrongfully terminated, uh, she vacated her post and ran out of there because essentially she was a coward. And uh, those are the kind of people that you know we have to stand up to. Uh, they can they can dish it out, but they don't take it too well <laughs> in return. And uh, so that there's there's a story there. There's things I learned about. You know, how if you're being mistreated, you need to document things, you need to make sure who you talk to at work, you don't gossip about it, you know, to people that could go tell someone else, oh, so-and-so said this. It's hard not to gossip at, 
you know, jobs where, you know, you're working very closely with someone else and maybe they have the same issues with the same people and you guys want to vent to each other, really have to watch that. Um, you have to be extremely uh, proactive about documenting, writing down times, dates, uh, documenting incidents that are happening to you where this unfair treatment is, you know, presenting itself over and over again. Uh, you need to know how different uh, state agencies work, uh, the Department of Human Services, uh, where I went to report how the children were being treated, the Department of Human Rights, where I went to report how I was being treated. Uh, certain things were said about me being a male in that job, which amounted to gender discrimination. So I, I talked to them. Uh, that was a leverage I had was that the Department of Human Rights was involved. Um, and that was a leverage in, in causing my employer to finally settle the matter with me in a way that was satisfactory to me. Um, so that was that was important that I went to the Department of Human Rights um, and that, uh, you know, I think a lot of uh, employers are, are powerful. I mean, I had to speak up against several levels of managers that all spoke out against me. There was even an unemployment benefits hearing uh, where they claimed uh, fraudulently that I had committed employment misconduct. I shouldn't get unemployment. Uh, and I, I went in there and I, I stood up against four levels of management and the same supervisor, in fact, was against me as well there. And I prevailed. I presented the truth. I told my story and uh, they couldn't all get their story straight. And uh, so I, I prevailed and I, I was awarded employment uh, benefits because I had not committed employment misconduct and the judge could see that pretty easily. So it's a story that, you know, employers have power, employers, some employers you know, hopefully a lot of them use their power responsibly. Some of them uh, abuse their power and uh, really think that, hey, you know, same thing kind of as in the last story, no one's going to do anything about it. You know, they think these employees are little people, we're big people, we're bigger than them. You know, majority of them aren't going to take, take it seriously or fight the system um, because it is so difficult and stressful and frustrating. And uh, I think it... Uh, I think the story shows that, you know, you can fight back, just like in the prior story, in a different way, though. You can fight back and you can prevail and you can win and uh, you can bring about the greater good that way. You know, even if you don't win by standing up to your employer, maybe you're going to make it a better environment for the next person that comes in there. The next you that comes through the doors and has to put up with the same same crap that these people think they can get away with. because. Nobody's challenging them. Nobody's, you know, people are taking it. And so that's uh, another very unique life situation. Yeah. That, and it's another example of you kind of continuously pushing and saying, I want this resolved. Like, this is important to not just let it drop. So at any point with kind of either of these situations you went through, did you ever feel like, I just want, want to walk away. I can't do this anymore. Yes. Um, well, well, not at the not so much at the time. I think I'm I'm maybe I'm unusually stubborn, <laughs> but I think I, I really have a very very passionate feeling about if something is right or just, it should it should be done that way. And that's idealistic. And the real world, look around the world everywhere. There's there's plenty of places where there is never any justice in this world. Um, uh, I think I was just. I have a strong value about trying to bring about justice. Uh, looking back on it after it was done, I realized how how hard and difficult it was. And it made me realize that I think some of these systems are set up so that the employers win, you know, so that most people will just say, oh, you know, even if I, I can prevail down the road, it is such a hassle and it's so much stress and I got to go through all of this stuff. I'll just take my lumps and walk away. And that's what the companies count on because I couldn't believe how much this employer had done wrong. And I, looking back on it, it was like, how did they think they were going to just get away with this? And they thought it because we, the employees, too many of us have just backed away and let them get away with it. I think no one has taken them to task. And I, I took them to task. And for better or worse, uh, in this situation, and I think it brought about changes at this particular facility too. I can only hope it did. I don't know anymore, but um, I certainly felt like I had uh, done something I was proud of. I stood up for myself. I didn't 
uh, have any regrets. But yeah, it's a miserable experience and things need to change so that it's not so miserable. So it's a little bit closer to being a level playing field for the little guy to stand up to an employer that is taking full advantage of him. And so that's an important concept, I think. And it's up to, you know, it's everybody's choice, you know, if they want to take on something like this and if so, how far they want to take it, that's, that's up to everybody to decide. But um, I think I wanted to, I had a positive outcome and I wanted to sort of share that story that, again, that the idea that there is hope. Yes. And it is good that you got a good result. Now you have one more book that you have published so far. Can you, so do you want to share about that one as well? Yeah, that was uh, another instance of uh, the whole race issue uh, coming up with living in uh, Minnesota. I had gone to a, uh, it's kind of a big, uh, kind of a summary of the whole story. Um, but uh, it was my fourth book and it was, I called it Minority Viewpoint. Um, uh, basically my experience uh, with the uh, American justice system. And uh, basically, it was a story of uh, I stayed at a hotel. Uh, I was chaperoning a group of my friend's kids. I stayed at a hotel in uh, northern Minnesota, a small northern Minnesota town. Uh, there was a lady working at the hotel, um, a employee of the hotel whose job is supposed to be to, you know, treat the guests like a king or a queen, you know, serve the guest and stuff. And uh, from the moment I walked in, this person had a chip on their shoulder against me, and I couldn't figure out right away what that was. Um, but circumstances made it pretty clear that uh, she had an issue with the fact that I wasn't white, and I was chaperoning a group of kids where uh, several of them were Caucasian, most of them were Caucasian. There was a black African-American uh, kid in the group as well, but I was chaperoning these kids. Um, she had some concerns she shared that uh, if they had been legitimate concerns, there was a legitimate way for her to address those concerns, which would have been fine. But this was more a thing of her basically acting out like a bully, like somebody that I uh, would have encountered in middle school or something. Um, and uh, being very uh, outwardly aggressive towards me and towards the kids. And eventually I, I stood up to her and I, when I checked out, I, I sent a lengthy uh, report to the owner of the hotel. You know, saying, you know, I'm a customer, um, you know, I, I've come to this property before, I haven't had any problems, you know, I was chaperoning this group of kids to swim at the pool, uh, this individual who's an employee of yours working at the front desk, which is a job I've actually done before, I've been the front desk uh, worker at hotels in when I was much younger, so I know how much they're supposed to, how respectful they're supposed to be, how you're supposed to, you know, accommodate the guest, how you're supposed to have a basic respect. And if you have a legitimate concern, address it legitimately. You know, there's nothing wrong with addressing a concern in a legitimate way. In this case, we had an individual that uh, made things up um, in a way of retaliating uh, for the fact that I reported her to her employer. And as a paying customer, I said to the, you know, to the hotel's owner that, you know, uh, I had a very bad experience, and this is the way I was treated. And he said, you know, hey, I'm really sorry this happened to you. And I said, you know, I would, uh, your place, I stay at your hotel because it's very close to one of the kids' houses that, you know, my friend, my friend's daughter that lives there, and I take the kids and chaperone them and stuff uh, for fun activities. And I said, it's very close to their house. That's why I stayed there. That's why I've been staying there. But if this kind of thing happens again, you know, I can, I can take my business to the bigger town about 20 miles away, you know. so. I'm the customer here. And I got a what seemed like a really heartfelt apology from the owner of the hotel and that, you know, we're very sorry. I'm going to address this with my staff. You know, this is over Thanksgiving weekend, so I'm out of town now, but I'll come back and I'll address it with my staff. And thank you for being my guest. I assure you this will not happen to you again. Uh, and then that was it. Nothing more happened. And I didn't hear any more about it. I assumed he's talked to the employee and he straightened her out and, you know, kind of, you know, some kind of coaching or reprimand or some, you know, something that would make sense. And then uh, I came back four months later. People invited me back. My friends invited me back. I came back four months later. And right as I made that reservation four months after the fact to come back, this hotel worker then immediately saw my new reservation four months later. And at that point, she went to the police and basically told them that I'm a child molester. 
made up all this story. She made up a claim that I was sexually abused myself as a child, so therefore I'm more likely to be a predator today, which I was never sexually abused as a child, nor since my childhood, fortunately. So she completely made that up. Um, she also made up the fact that um, there was a teenage, uh, a female, minor female in the hotel room with me, which was never, ever the case. The only person in the hotel room with me was a uh, minor male whose parents uh, had uh, full permission for me to be in the room. He had a, We had double beds. He had his own bed. I had my own bed. The parents had known me for many years. They had I had full permission to have this kid in my care. Um, but she told the police, oh, no, 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 it was a female that lives in the area that was alone in the room that spent the night in the room with me, which obviously says that anyone doing that, any adult male in a room with a female juvenile that they're not related to is, is doing it to be a sexual predator. And so she told these outright lies to the to the police department and created an investigation. The investigation turned up absolutely nothing um, They because I didn't do anything. Uh, I was surprised that in the course of the investigation, the police never even interviewed me. They never reached out to me to speak to me. And later on, the, the lead, uh, the chief of police of the city said, we couldn't find anything to validate any of this. We didn't feel it was even worth our time to talk to him. So the investigation was closed very quickly with no finding of any wrongdoing, because there wasn't any. But the, it was a very small town, and those defamatory allegations spread very fast among some of the parents of these kids who ended up believing that. And so it's a story of what, and this was all sparked by race, ethnicity, the fact that this employee, uh, upon first glimpse of me, did not like the fact that I was dark-skinned, that I was not white or Caucasian, and that I was with children who were. Uh, she immediately decided that uh, I was a criminal of some kind. Um, rather than, and again, if she had a legitimate concern, she could have called the police right at that time when I first visited and said, hey, you know, there's this person here I've never seen before, and he's with some kids, and they don't look like they're his children. Why don't you come check it out? And that would have been fine. That wouldn't have been defamatory towards anybody. You know, the police would have come talk to me and the kids and talk to the parents and found out that, oh, yeah, they, they've got permission for this person to be chaperoning them. All the parents know about it. This is a legitimate person to be here with these kids. Everybody knows where they are, blah, blah, blah. That would have been the end of it. Uh, there was there's no reason to. So I encourage people, if there's a situation they're concerned about, to appropriately investigate. And that's fine to call the police. I took an issue with waiting four months, saying you're this concerned, and then waiting four months until I make a reservation to return and then being tipped off that I'm returning, then going to the police four months later, and then making things up. That never happened. Uh, so eventually there was, a, there was a case I brought against this woman because my reputation was badly damaged, and I was not successful in that case. I learned a lot about lawyers, <laughs> the legal world, how your own lawyer may not have your best interest at heart. And that was a huge, painful lesson I learned in this story. Um, minority viewpoint, my experience as a person of color with the American justice system. And I learned a lot about how people of color are treated, uh, how you can be treated by a law firm that you put your trust and faith in, and it turns out that that law firm primarily just wants to make money off of you, and they don't really care about the outcome. It doesn't harm them, and that if you fall prey to this, there isn't a whole lot you can do in the legal community to seek remedy after the fact. And I didn't know any of that. And what exactly is involved that, you know, somebody does something horrible to you, and maybe you might have grounds to sue them, what's actually involved? If you sue somebody, I had no idea. So that's also a manual on, you know, for because average people don't go around thinking about, OK, I need to educate myself on how I'm going to sue somebody, you know, because if you're a normal, non vindictive person, I'd lived 40 some years without ever having to go to court or sue anybody. And I thought I would finish my lifespan without ever having to do such a thing. And suddenly a horrible situation happens. You never expect it like an accident. You never expect an accident. This thing happens. You find your, you know, your safety is endangered by somebody spreading malicious information. You may have to take a legal route, and uh, this book teaches somebody how to do that better.
and how to take a stand and stand up for yourself. Well, I appreciate you sharing that story along with all of your other stories. It's so interesting Thank to you. hear like so many facets of life that one person can go through. And the fact that then you're sharing this with other people through your books right? is, yes, <laughs> is, is yeah. so important. Now, before I start to wrap things up, is there anything else you would like to share with our listeners? Uh, just that it's been a uh, privilege to uh, share a little bit. I hope I didn't uh, talk too much and uh, overstay my welcome. Um, if anybody has any uh, thoughts, questions, uh, comments, feedback, anything like that, my website is authorsumi.com. All four of my books are on Amazon and available uh, to be to be looked at on author sumi a u t h o r s u m i author sumi dot com and uh, and there's a link there to communicate with me as well if there's any questions concerns comments feedback um, I'm usually a pretty open guy to that stuff so. great and I will of course leave that link in the description here. Now at the end That's of great. all my episodes, I do ask my guests a random question. My question for you is, what was your favorite children's book? Dr. Seuss. Do you have a specific Dr. I, I would, Seuss? Um, all of them, really. I liked a bunch of them. Yeah, I really liked Dr. Seuss. Uh, I think there was one called uh, uh, Going to Salasalu. Like going to this, I forget what it's called, but Dr. Seuss. Dr. Seuss was a big one. All right, that brings this episode to a close. As I just mentioned, I will be leaving Sumi's website in the description. So feel free to go connect with him, check out all of his books and get all of that good information there. And if you would like to connect with the podcast, our website is also in the description. As always, that brings you to our social media, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. If you'd like to go follow those pages, I always appreciate that support. And if you'd like to support the podcast monetarily, a link to do that is in the description as well. My email is also in the description if you would like to reach out and be a guest on the show. I always love hearing from new people and getting different stories, so feel free to connect with me. Thank you so much, Sumi, for spending time with me today, and to my listeners for taking the time out of your day to hear a new story. Until next time, bye! Goodbye! Goodbye!